been following the services online will know and realize that we are following the series of the book of Judges. And today we are focusing in particular on Judges chapter 11, verse 29 to 40. And it is the life of Jephthah. Last week, Baba Makoni uh, introduced the same subject, the same judge, and the Lord is allowing us today to look at some details. I believe that the Lord wants us to learn more about this judge, Jephthah. And therefore, we turn to that scripture, Judges chapter 11, verse 29 to 40. It has already been read uh, to us, and allow me to pray, and please let me make a confession. As, um, as I pray, there is a sense in which, I've said to one or two brothers this morning, there is a sense in which I feel like I've never been to church before. And um, you feel totally inadequate. So let's immerse ourselves into the word of God and into the life of this scripture so that the Lord himself will reveal himself to all of us. Much especially if you have someone preaching who feels like he has never been to church before. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we need you. Burukai Baba, Zirati Zemurimi, and let us never miss the message for which you have gathered us, each one of us. Thank you so much for all the singing. Thank you so much for the ministry which you have already done by the singing, by the praise and worship, by hymns, and by the fellowship so far. And now, Lord, I pray that as you allow me to continue in this fellowship, let me not deviate to your mission and to your purpose. And let no thought stray around of mine, of my brothers, of my sisters, and of those who are listening online. Allow us to attend to your purpose and to your message. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So Judges chapter 11 obviously follows Judges chapter 10. And we want to find our background to Judges chapter 11, this passage of scripture. We have decided to raise five points. You can raise as many points as you want as a form of background to this passage of scripture. But let's attend, and please forgive the PowerPoint notes some, uh, as they come out, if they are coming out. Uh, the font and all the typing and everything may be very tiny. But let's attend to what the Lord himself is leading us to. So these are the five points we see in the background from Judges chapter 10. And we take it from verse 6, number 1. We see that in Judges chapter 10, verse 6, the Bible says, Then the children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, and saved the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria and the gods of Sidon and the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not save him. So as we come to Judges chapter 10, in our background, we have this reality that the children of Israel, if you remember when we read our call to worship from 1 Chronicles chapter 16, we noted that God had promised that I'm going to give you this land to the children of Israel. We noted that King David was praying and acknowledging that God had made a covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. 
And when God made that covenant with them, he had actually performed by placing them in the land of Canaan. But in Judges chapter 10 verse 6, we see that the children of Israel forsook the Lord and sought after the gods of the people whom God had driven out of the land of Canaan. What a sad background. And what is said background for a people who were loved of the Lord, people who were chosen of the Lord, and placed in a land that flowed with milk and with honey. And they forsook the Lord God who had built cities for them by driving away these nations. Sad reality. Now, sometimes I look at this passage and I look at it historically and look back into centuries and say, these people, how could they have forsaken the Lord? But I am with them in the background. I am with them in the background in the sense that these people forsook the Lord who had given them the land of Canaan. But I, in this generation and in this time, God not only gave me the life which I'm living today, but God gave himself and he gave his son. And there are many times I identify with these people that I forsake the Lord, his work, his purpose. I am in the background with these people. Now, if you and me, my brothers, are in that same background, the Lord is speaking to us today. Number two, we not and take note for our time, I'm not going to concentrate much, but it says again. And again, as I said, the church has been following the book of uh, Judges. And we see this whole cycle of the children of Israel sinning before the Lord and them crying before the Lord. The Lord being merciful to them, forgives them, raises a judge or deliverer or king or someone who is going to be raised of the Lord. And when he does that, they experience the peace and the shalom and the rule of God and the love of God. And they sin again and they go throughout this cycle. There are many times our lives are like that. When even in our own lives, circumstances and situations come and we cry to God and God hears us and delivers us and we fall back into that cycle. The God of mercy speak to our hearts. Number two, we note that in verse 7 of Judges chapter 10, this brought anger before the Lord. My brothers and my sisters, sin is not cosmetic. How much ever we say it. Sin is not something to play with. It brings anger before the Lord. My brothers and my sisters, we did not make ourselves to be here on earth. We were made in the image of God, who is holy. And when we sin, sin brings anger before the Lord. And it is the Lord who is angry, it's not Quirirai. If it was Quirirai or some ruler of the world, my brothers and my sisters, it would be better. Because I'm only finite. If it was even just your church or your pastor, it's even better. It's the Lord who becomes angry with the sin, and we see it. That when the Lord became angry with the sin, they got into bondage, the children of Israel. And this is how we are arriving at the passage of Jephthah. The children of Israel are beginning, which is point number three, are now oppressed by the people whom they had defeated before by the people whom they needed to defeat, whom they did not even need to think about as any threat. Because tell you what, 
behind the children of Israel was and is the God of heaven. Him who called them is greater than anything that is surrounding them. But somehow their hearts get attracted and sometimes fear these other gods whom they saw. And they did not have hearts of faith that trusted the Lord who is spirit and truth. And they wanted some idols and things which they could see and worship. The Lord gave them offer. Then we see again in Judges chapter 10, which brings hope to each one of us, verse 10, that these children of Israel, they repented. They went back to the Lord and cried and said, we have sinned. We have worshipped the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the foreign gods and the people we didn't know. And now we are in bondage. And we see in Judges chapter 16, and I will read that. So chapter 10, verse 16. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and saved the Lord. And take note, and his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. This is the nature of our God. I wish I can preach him more. To bring him to your heart, my brother and my sister. That God loves you so much. That when you put yourself and when I put myself in the muddy and misery of my sins. And I turn back with a broken heart that says, God, I repent, I have sinned. God cannot stand to see you and me in the misery of sin and in the misery of the death that comes with sin. His nature and his heart is full of love and full of power to forgive, to deliver, to welcome. He is tender to bring us to him. And when you read even the New Testament, you see that he sent his son to identify with us. To be with us in our failures, in our struggles. And when he sent his son Jesus to identify with us, he did that so that we could almost as it were feel his presence walking side by side in our infirmities. I want to bring a message of hope to a sinner today. And I want to bring a message of hope to you and to me. That God, according to verse 16 of Judges chapter 10, his soul could no longer endure the misery of Israel. Hallelujah. Sinner, if you are here, <laughs> sinner, if you are here, the God of all the earth who created you in his own image does not endure to see you continuing in the bondage of sin. Sinner, if you are here, by any name of it, the Lord does not endure to continue seeing you and I speak this more to Kirirai and to all of you, my brothers and my sisters. I want to bring to your heart that the heart of God wants to deliver you. The heart of God is sending a judge into your life and into my life. And a Jephthah. Hallelujah. So with that background, the God who cannot endure to continue seeing you in the misery of sin sends a savior. And you know, Baba Makoni last week helped us as we delved into the life of Jephthah. Jephthah 
was born out of marriage, so to speak. Is that so? And his brothers, when they saw that the Jephthah was among them, they drove him away. He was completely rejected because they thought he was going to have a portion. And this is the same period when we see that the children of Israel were forsaking the Lord and they forsook Jephthah, who according to, to, to verse 1 of Judges chapter 11, he was a mighty man of valor. Hallelujah. They forsook him. And this is Jephthah who is coming in a time and in a life where the Lord cannot endure to see the misery of the children of Israel. But the children of Israel, they forsake Jephthah. And we see in Judges chapter 11 verse 29 that Jephthah Judges chapter 11, verse 29. We see that Jephthah makes himself speak to the Lord or listen to the Lord and the Spirit of the Lord leading him. It says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. Now, for those who were here last week, Baba Makoni illustrated and preached the powerful sermon of how Jephthah did the victory and the, uh, Jephthah was called by the Gileadites and they had said to him, you are going to be uh, our ruler if you are going to overcome the Ammonites because the Ammonites were standing there and the Israelites were standing there and they were in fear and trepidation almost mirroring what was going to happen some years later when King David came, when the Philistines with their giant Goliath were standing there and the Israelites were trembling. And at that point, God raised David in Onendo, who was out in the sheep field. At this point, God takes Jephthah a throw away to bring him to face the Ammonites. But take note that verse 29. Mambo jeso wanyika tsoka zangu mumafuta sura zaruka imindo pindando itaminana Now, in verse 29 of Judges chapter, tw chapter 11, then the Spirit of God came upon Jephthah. Hallelujah. An onendo thrown away. Someone who was not expected to be great upon them. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Hallelujah. I want to talk to a sinner. I want to talk to someone who may be feeling rejected and thrown away, who may be feeling defeated and even exiled by circumstances of life, such that when people gather, you can't even come close because you feel like I am an outcast. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. How I pray that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon someone who feels rejected today. How I pray that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon someone who is on the outskirts, who is never given a pulpit to preach on, <laughs> who is never given any circumstance to not sure. And God is speaking to you if you are within the pews today. And the Spirit of the Lord is not limited to speak to you in your life. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh and passed through Mizpah. 
We are going to go verse by verse. But I want us to understand that everything that follows is following where Jephthah is now under the guidance and the direction of the Spirit of God who has come upon him. And in many respects, talking to the New Testament church today, I'm reminded of what the Lord Jesus himself, the founder and the rock upon which the church is built, said to his disciples, tarry ye in Jerusalem until you are endured with power from on high. And he gives his spirit without limit to anyone. And you will pass through many different places when the spirit of the Lord is upon you. You will get through the fire when the spirit of the Lord is upon you. You will get through many difficult circumstances when the spirit of the Lord is upon you. You will face many enemies when the spirit of the Lord is upon you. But as you do that, it is in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you can be confident in everything. When everyone else looks at you and thinks that he is finished, he is not there, he is not in the game, the Spirit of the Lord will be upon you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, brothers and sisters. May we be encouraged. And Jephthah makes a vow in verse 13 of Judges chapter 11. Now, I want us to take note of the following scriptures. Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 21. Take note of the, those scriptures and realize that vows were almost a common practice or something that people could do. And, but what was critical is that whatever you vowed to perform or to do, you should not take it lightly. You must perform. That's the law of the Lord. Hallelujah. And it continues today. When you have committed yourself to following the Lord, follow the Lord. When you have committed yourself to come to church, come to church. When you have committed yourself to loving the Lord Jesus, love the Lord. When you have committed yourself to sin no more, Sin no more. Jephthah made a vow. Now, I was given the title for the sermon to say, be careful little mouth what you say. The reason why we have to be careful what we say, it's because vows were very important you could not walk back on them. Because when you vow, you have taken heaven and earth to be the witness. But beyond heaven and earth, you have taken God to be the witness into it. So you have put the name of God into it. And God is faithful. When you are now trying to break a vow, it's like you are cutting and killing God. <laughs> Does that happen? That's why vows were important for anyone to make them after full consideration. But not only after full consideration, when you were making a vow, you needed to make it in the power of God. Because you don't have power to perform anything on your own. Hallelujah. So take note of what you say. 
It's not in your wealth. It's not in your muscles. It's not in your capacity. It is in God. Take note. And and Jephthah's vow, when he made it, I'm sure you will read those scriptures. When he made it, he made it, according to verse 31, with yet another compounded commitment. He said, whatever comes from my house, I will give it to you. Now, give it to God is important. You can give anything alive. But he compounded it by saying, I will give it as a burnt offering. I am showing my commitment that whatever comes first, I don't value it at all. I value you, O oh God. And what could possibly come from his house? Many things could come from his house. But what we see in this passage of scripture, what came out of Jephthah's house was his daughter. The only daughter Jephthah had. The only child because the scripture says he didn't have a son. Now, when I was reading this scripture, forgive me, I'm only human. I need to be baptized, pastor. <laughs> when I was reading this scripture, I said to myself, but honestly, Jephthah, <laughs> what was he thinking? Was he thinking that out of his house will come a, a chicken or something. <laughs> but a chicken would not come out. <laughs> he wouldn't keep it inside. W- would it come, uh, c- could it be a dog or something? But honestly, no. Because was he having a secret prayer to say, could it be my wife? <laughs> So these kinds of thoughts, you don't discuss them with your wife (laughs) when when you are preparing a sermon. (laughs) What was he saying? So I said, but then I realized, then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. Hallelujah. So, whatever it was that he was saying, wife, anything else, or perhaps even the daughter, is a show of his commitment to say, God, you know that, because the Bible says the Lord searches the heart. He knows the heart. God, you You know the throne of my heart and everything. You know that at the center of my heart there is my daughter. Now I am saying if you give me the victory and the peace, I will be able to offer even my daughter because she means nothing compared to who you are and the shalom peace which you are going to give me as I come back from the Amorites. My Nikki, do you identify with this? She has a good daughter. And the Bible, as if it is to test, yet we know that God does not test people. Hallelujah. God does not tempt people. But the Bible, to emphasize that God is in control, says Jephthah, said this, or implies that Jephthah said this under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Maybe we'll see the lesson to our hearts as God was leading Jephthah. But in verse 32, so a bargain has been made. 
God, if you are going to lead me to defeat the Ammonites and I come back in peace. In other words, God, if you are going to show up as the God Almighty who fights and wins battles in my life, God, if you are going to show up as the Lord Jehovah Shalom, the one who is going to bring me in peace. God, if you are going to show up as the Lord Shama, whose presence is going to be with me as I go to this battle with these uh, Ammonites. God, if you are, if you are, if you are, if you are, this is the side of Jephthah. And Jephthah, God says, you have made the vow. I will show up. But you must just go and fight the war. Amen. You need to go and fight the war. And Jephthah, according to verse 32, according to verse 33, he went ahead to fight against them. Trusting that God in all his power, the great I am, is going to lead me. After all, his Holy Spirit was upon him. After all, his presence was upon him. And he already had surrendered himself and said, God, my side of the bargain will come later after you have shown yourself up. Hallelujah. And Jephthah goes to fight the Ammonites. And in verse 33, the Bible tells us that indeed the Lord showed himself to subdue the Ammonites. Hallelujah. The Lord gave victory to Jephthah. The Lord gave victory to the children of Israel. The Lord showed up. He is Jehovah, the one who wins my battles. And he will show up in your life that he will win your battles. He is Jehovah, the one who gives me peace. He will show up in your life. He is Jehovah, the one who leads you in life. He will show up in your life. He is Jehovah, the one whose presence will go with you and will come back with you wherever you go. His presence will show in your life. And in verse 33 there, we actually see that the Lord delivers victory to the children of Israel. And the mighty Ammonites are defeated. And the word which is used there is that they were subdued by the children of Israel. Hallelujah. Now what we know is that the Lord Jesus went already into our lives and took the crown of victory. Hallelujah. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Jesus by dying and rising from the dead, he defeated the sin. He defeated even death. He rose with all power. And we, the believers, have been given the victory in Christ Jesus. That's what God does. Now let's see the reaction of Jephthah. And Jephthah's reaction in verse 34. So as he is coming, he sees his daughter dancing with the tambourine. Now, it reminds me of that time when the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea and Moses wrote this song, worshipping and praising the Lord. And Miriam came with the tambourines and she was dancing and giving glory and honor to God. Almost the same here, the daughter of Jephthah is coming to celebrate the victory which God has given. And as she came, in verse 34, we see that she is celebrating. Then verse 35, we take note that Jephthah says, oh no. Do we not sometimes come to those points when it is required of us that the commitment we gave, the commitment we made, where we said we want to save the Lord, when it comes to the actual performance, Sometimes we say, oh, no, this is too much. My only daughter, 
So when you are called to save the Lord, save the Lord, hallelujah. Sorry about the time, I will just rush the last three uh, points that I need to just make. When we are called to save the Lord, save the Lord, hallelujah. Now what it meant to give as a burnt offering was already outlined in Leviticus chapter 1. So what Jephthah needed to do here was to literally do as what Father Abraham wanted to do on Isaac, his son. Hallelujah. So this is exactly what Jephthah was going to do. My daughter, you are going to be offered. I have made already a covenant to God. I cannot walk back. Hallelujah. So when we sing that hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. No more turning back. That is what it means. Brothers and sisters, what God demands from us when we have made a decision to follow Christ, he demands our whole, our everything. You know, pastors are in trouble. To find the people saving in the church is a problem. We are busy right now looking for people to be members or to to come into the leadership, to become elders, to become deacons, to serve in ministries, and to do the work which the Lord wants us to do. There are many people who say, yes, I committed to come to church, but ah, too much. Now, this is not about Central Baptist. The lesson we learn out of this is that when God has called you and you have made a commitment, you are called wholesomely with your everything. And it is not cheap. Serving God is not cheap. Let's not lie to one another. Serving God is always a sacrifice. And a sacrifice which Jephthah committed to was a burnt offering. Read Leviticus about the laws of the burnt offering. The Bible says it must be without blemish. The Bible says it must be a sweet smelling aroma before the Lord. And this is a sacrifice which must be put into the fire. I've seen many people who have turned their back on the church and the work of God. Because somehow they think this is too much. It's taking all the time. It's taking all the money. I have no time to myself. God demands your all. Your wholesome. That which is precious to you. Whether it is time, it is money, it is family. Everything, including yourself, because you belong to the Lord. When you make a vow, you fulfill the promise. And finally, just so that we take note. I'm not going to preach a theology about people going to the mountain to wail about the virginity of the daughter of uh, Jephthah. What we learn is that it costs. It costs it cost Jephthah, it cost even the daughter, but she laid herself before the Lord. My father, if you have said a vow before God, fulfill that. And Jesus did the same. Not my will, but yours be done. And what we are called to do is that we must come and give ourselves to him. As I conclude, I would want to talk to just two, three people. Just three people. The backslider and the sinning child of God. Our background showed us that God could not stand the misery that they were in, in bondage. Come to him. He's ready to save. If there's anyone who doesn't know the Lord Jesus as his Lord and Savior, be encouraged in your heart that God wants to save you.
and he raised already in Jesus Christ a judge and a savior. Number two, the believer who is here, we are called, we are called to sacrifice. We are called to give ourselves fully to the Lord. And we trust in the power of the Spirit that he will lead us. And maybe to all of us, be careful the commitment you make and make it as a vow to the Lord. May the Lord help us as we reflect on this scripture, trusting him as the Savior. I want us to pray before we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus and the pastor to lead us in the communion. Father, here is your church and you are you. Lead us, guide us, speak to us in our individual positions and as you called us, assuring us of your presence, your deliverance and give us the strength to commit and to do as you will and as you purpose. Be pleased among us, even as we continue with the worship and sacrificing to your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, 